All right, welcome back to another edition of Mississippi Stories. And this is one I think is going to be a lot of fun. Um, our guest today is somebody that I've had the pleasure of knowing for a few years, uh, probably longer than either one of us will admit. Uh, Jill Connor Brown is the multiple number one New York Times bestselling author of nine Sweet Potato Queens books and has created a global phenomenon of 6,200 chapter groups in 37 countries. Based on her philosophy of worldview as recounted through these rollicking, raucous, and riotously funny essays, women and smart men understand that body sassy, down-to-earth humor is simply the vehicle in which the greater message is conveyed. That is one of self-reliance and empowerment, inspiring all to do what makes the heart sing. Jill, um, and that is exactly why I wanted you on today, because we are living in uncertain times. At least that's what the nice people in the commercials keep telling us. And um, I wanted to kind of get your take on how to kind of navigate the landmines that we're dealing with right now through humor and faith and all the good things that you put out into the world. Well, I think the first thing we have to acknowledge is that all times are uncertain. That's true. <laughs> Certainty of any time of any security in this world is a delusion. Yes. <laughs> and, but, you know, the only security we have for me is, you know, within. That's right. That's right. You know, it's, it's whatever comes on this plane, you know? Right. Well, I think you're right on that. You know, I was thinking about that because somebody was telling about, oh, we're living in these terrible times and everything. And I was thinking about my grandparents on December 7th, 1941, tucking in my, my dad, you know, I mean, here they'd just gone through the great depression and now there was a global war. So yeah, we'll make it. And I mean, there's always something to be terrified of in the world, but there's also always something to laugh at and always something to be grateful for. You have mastered the art of, of, of basically poking fun at things that most people would be scared about. And I think that's truly one of your superpowers. And I think that's what's made the Sweet Potato Queens so powerful as an empowering tool to help women was because there are things, there are a lot of issues that you've been able to take and just turn it on its ear with humor on that. Is that something that started with you when you were really young or when did you develop this ability to be able to laugh at the things that drive most people crazy? Well, you know, I, I, it's, a, it's been a life style. It's been how, how I was brought up. My family, uh, my sister and I, um, and, and our parents, my, my father was extremely funny and other people found our mother funny. Your mama is so funny. We just be going, oh, she, she is. Not. And that's probably how my daughter feels about me is no, she's not funny, but <laughs> it's, um, we were always brought up to deal with, we dealt with everything with humor. Um, it works for us. I don't know how people make it otherwise without a spiritual life and a sense of humor. Lord, the whole world is Eeyore. Yeah, no, no kidding. I mean, it, and it seems like, and this is just my take on it. And I've been, I've fallen into the trap too, uh, since the pandemic started. It's like people are like getting on Facebook and just venting their spleen and they're so angry. And it's like people, we've kind of forgotten how to, you know, A, have empathy, but also B, you know, how to learn to laugh at some of these things that are going on a little bit. What advice would you give people besides basically <laughs> turn off Facebook for a little bit? Yeah, certainly turn off the news, but you know, lots of funny stuff on look at. Yeah. But it, you know, these people that, you know, we're vilifying as, you know, incarnate evil or whatever are our neighbors. And, yeah. and you know, they're not evil. You know, you sit next to them in church, you meet them on the street, you know, they are to stop saying that, you know, and this vaccine, it's what we've got so far. They never said it was a hundred percent. It's not like the measles vaccine. <clears throat> if you get that, you're not getting the measles, but it's the best we've got right now. And masks, if you don't think masks work then at all, then have your surgeon be mask free the next time you're <laughs> Yes, it, it doesn't make us invisible or bulletproof, but it's what we've got. Do what you can. Well, yeah, yeah I think that's a, that's a good point. Do what you can. It's, and, it's, and stay home. Stay home. It's perfect. I haven't been on my porch 
for a year and a half and couldn't be happier. <laughs> I go to Kroger. I go to Tractor Supply. I go to Home Depot. <laughs> and I, or I, I go to um, Corner Market, which here in Raymond will forever be the sunflower. Yeah. You know, here. But I wear a mask. I wash my hands and I'm happy. I mean, I, I, if anything good comes out of this whole pandemic, it may be hand washing and, and maybe people stop before they pick their nose. Right. Yeah. Well, it's a barrier, at least to that. Exactly. It's always something positive. But, you know, just and quit being so mean. You don't have to be mean <laughs> to other people. It's, you know. And, and I and I get it. I mean, I, I get that people are under stress. And I mean, Lord knows it's it, like you said, you watch the news and you're like, oh, my God, you know, it's it's the, the comments about to hit us or something. But um, and by the way, I'm going to just totally backtrack here for a second. You mentioned Tractor Supply Warehouse. That place <laughs> is amazing. And I'm not I'm not sponsored by them and I'm not giving them a free plug. <laughs> but by, <laughs> yeah. Any place that sells batteries fertilizer, fish food, and live chicks is okay oh, with me. I love chickens, you know. They yeah. See the chickens in there. Yeah. And Tractor Supply is a great place, as is Home Depot. Yeah. Church, well, my husband. Yes. I can completely get lost in there. I understand on that one on that. Um, but you're right, you're right about the vilification. And I mean, like I said, uh, I, I have to sit here and say my, my halo is not real bright right now because – you know, part of what I do for a living, I guess, is vilify people with editorial cartoons in some <laughs> some sense of it. But I generally like to think I poke fun at them more than I vilify them. But, you yeah, know, I, if, I, I hate it that, you know, that you deliver the greater message through humor and right. hopefully people get the message. No, you could be really mean. <laughs> but No, you have not been. Well, I mean, I am a survivor of J.J. Daniels seventh grade, you know, and that was like. <laughs> You, you had to use your tongue to survive. You know, it was, it was as much about being able to cut somebody down verbally as it was to be able to, to fight them. But, you know, I think just if you're, if people are depressed, there is always somebody that's got problems that you're glad you don't have. <laughs> you know, yeah. Find somebody worse off than you and see what you can do to help them. I mean, and everybody can do something from right where you are at home. You don't have to leave. When it first started, my next door neighbor is, um, they've got some health issues and there was not, she couldn't get out and do anything. Of course, we were asked not to. She made masks. She can sew. She made masks by the thousand and I delivered them. That's what I can do. I can't sew to save my soul. But, you know, there's something everybody can do to help somebody else and plenty of people are needing help. I mean, that's, I think that's actually a pretty brilliant philosophy because, you know, I mean, if, if people always say, well, I can't change the world, but if you can change the world right around you, then if everybody did that, it would literally change the world. Do what's right in front of you with what you got right now. Today is all we've got. And that's true of all of this, the uncertain times. This moment is all we have, all anybody has. I don't care how much money they have or don't have, how sick or how well. This moment is all we've got. What you going to do with it? Your, your faith has always been something that's impressed me in the sense, and, and I know that's not why you have it. You're not, you're not one of those kind of people that puts it out there because you want people to say, oh, man, I love, Jill's faith's amazing. You know? but, but that said, I, you know, I've had a few roadblocks and stumbles and so forth in my career, and usually the first person to comment on any whiny post I put or anything like that is usually a, hey, it's going to be okay. And I'm getting it from you. When did you, I mean, obviously um, tell us a little bit about kind of your journey because um, I know you've been through some things and we've all been through things, but you've kind of developed this really strong philosophy of both faith and helping other people out on top of what we know you for, because I mean, we all know, well, you're the boss of the sweet potato Queens and we know that side of you. But on a very personal side, you've got an incredibly strong faith and one that manages to help other people out. And I don't think people, a lot of people know that about you. Well, I hope so. Thank you. Um, I, yes, I have, I have lived for a very long time. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, in, into each life, some crap must fall. And 
it's, <laughs> all of it, my faith is the whole Jesus story to, is about overcoming. Yeah. And he gives us that power to do that. But, you know, I was, um, you know, I never went to college um, because, I, which I have learned later in life was because I was afraid. Yeah. Because the only D I ever made in my life was in algebra two. And it was a pure gift. I can tell you, <laughs> I did not learn any algebra two. <laughs> I learned no more algebra two than I did hip hop when I took hip hop lessons. <laughs> so it's, um, and that terrified me. I had never come. So, and I mean, I, I actually did fail. She, I was just such a good student and everything else. She didn't fail me. Um, I had never failed at anything before, but I didn't realize that that's what influenced my decision to not go to college. At that time, I didn't realize you could go to college and not take uh, math. And I was going, God, what comes after algebra two? <laughs> what fresh hell is this? Yeah. So, you know, but like I said, I didn't realize that until much later, but you know, no matter what this bad decisions we make, um, God can overcome them. And all of my experiences have fed my humor. So that's what's, that's why people relate to my books is because I just tell, I have no pride and no shame. <laughs> and and um, even though no reason for the one and plenty of reason for the other, but I will tell anything and do. And so the books are, are of course, you know, Southern in perspective because by the grace of God, that's what I turned out to be. But the, the experiences are universal and it's always better to laugh at it to me than to, um, than to, you know, sit on the floor and cry because it's the same amount of time is going to go by no matter how you respond to it. So might as well get happy today. And, but yes, I mean, I had uh, the way my books came about, if it's not a God thing, there has never been a God thing <laughs> on earth. Um, you know, I was a uh, single mom, no child support, $30,000 in debt. Um, my mother was, I was taking care of my mother and my daughter. Um, and I, I wrote for three different papers as a stringer, which of course means no money. Um, and, uh, not that there's a whole lot of money in newspapers <laughs> anyway, but even less for the stringers. And, um, <clears throat> And I was a, a trainer at the YMCA, which I loved. And yeah. I did love every second of it. But And all of my friends came from in there. So a lot of the experiences came from my work. And But I wrote for the Clarion Ledger. I wrote a humorous fitness column. and Because <clears throat> I had no degrees in fitness either. The Y trained me in that. I have no training for anything. I'm completely unqualified to live. <laughs> I'm unemployable on every scale. But... <clears throat> I wrote for the Clarion Ledger. I wrote for uh, Malcolm White and Paul Canzanieri started uh, an underground paper, an alternative newspaper called the Diddy Wad Diddy. Mm -hmm. And I wrote for that under an assumed name. My pen name was Betty Fulton. <laughs> uh, Betty Fulton was a sheep in a book by Father Guido Sarducci, which to date is the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. It's a high school annual, it's the Shellville high school annual. And it looks like any high school annual you've ever seen or been in, except everybody in it is a sheep, <laughs> all different sheep. <laughs> the coaches are big, you know, burly, the French teacher had long curly hair. It's kind of trashy looking. And, um, everybody's a sheep. And Betty Fulton was like Miss thing. She was everything at Shellville high. And so that was my pen name. And I wrote for, uh, for Malcolm and Paul, the, the Diddy Why Diddy. And then um, Kevin and Rosalie Jones started the Mississippi Business Journal. And they were big Betty fans. Mm -hmm. And they came and said, you know, we want you to write for the Mississippi Business Journal. And I said, I've never had a job. I mean, <laughs> the volumes could be written of what I don't know about business. And I said, no, we want you to write Betty. Just clean her up a little bit because <laughs> The ditty was a little spicy. I had free reign in the ditty. But, um, and so I said, okay. So I wrote for those. Well, then, by and by, and I was perfectly happy. I was maintaining, I was servicing all my debt. 
I was absolutely, I was totally happy. I had no ambition beyond. I, I've never had any ambition for anything, but I was completely happy with that level of production and whatever. And so, <clears throat> and then the Mississippi Business Journal changed hands and the new people just stopped running my store. They never called. They never said boo. They just stopped running it. And I finally got somebody to call me back. And I said, you know, where's, where's my story? And they said, well, the guy said, well, maybe it's just me, but you're just not funny. And I said, clearly, it's just you. You know, <laughs> people have said many things to me in my life, true and untrue, kind and unkind, but no one has ever said to me, you're not funny. But they stopped running my story. And that was my light bill. Yeah. And so driven by that desperation and for no other reason, I looked for other avenues for writing. <clears throat> okay, so now also with the, it's totally a divine cosmic convergence of things. At this same time, um, Roy Blunt Jr. was publishing an anthology of Southern humor and he had been getting the Diddy Why Diddy from, from Malcolm for years, unbeknownst to me. And so out of the blue, he tracked me down through Malcolm. He'd been looking for Betty Fulton <laughs> to no avail. <laughs> She's a good pasture. And so he called me just out of the blue at home. One day I answered the phone and he says, you know, is this Betty Fulton? And I said, maybe. Um, Cause it was kind of a secret. And so, um, and so he said, you know, he was publishing this anthology and had been reading Betty Fulton and loved my work and wanted to publish one of my stories. So he did, which was totally amazing out of the blue to God thing again. And so <clears throat> as a result of that, you see how this is building on itself. Yeah. Okay. As a result of that, uh, the, what do you know show on NPR came to town to tape an episode um, as part of their fundraising stuff. And so I had just been in Roy's book and he had come for a book signing, had me come and sign with him. So totally generous. Yeah. <laughs> and they, um, then I asked, well, you know, who all is going to, so they asked me to be on the show because I was in Roy's book. And so I said, well, who else is going to be on there? And it was uh, Willie Morris, of course, one of our most revered Southern writers. And, um, I can't remember his name, but it was one of our, you know, thousand year old blues guys from the Delta and me. And I remember then, you know, the basic premise, the way Michael Feldman did. Michael was mean. <laughs> and, you know, his <laughs> was at the expense of his victims on his show. And so I knew who was going to be the fatted calf. It was going to be me. But I was prepared <laughs> and pretty much waxed his ass on his own radio show. And so which was uh, to the delight of her. And so all the Queens were there in the audience, of course, to support me. Yeah. And they were sitting right behind Willie and his wife, Joanne, Richard Morris, who were in, in the audience. And so they said, you know, Joanne and Willie were just howling, laughing when you were on there. And Willie said, who is she? Do we know her? She's funny. So I took that as my entree to insinuate myself into their lives, which I did. And because Joanne at that time was the chief editor at the University Press in Mississippi. And so called her up, went to see her, dragged, because I thought I, maybe that the University Press would publish a collection of stories that I had already written. And because I've seen them do that kind of stuff before. And I said, well, that would be really easy. And I am satanically lazy. And so <clears throat> Joanne saw me and, um, and she said, you know, I did know at least one thing about publishing is that they're never interested in one book. They always want to know what else you got. Yeah. So I said, well, you know, I've got this collection of stories that I've already written. And then I threw out the idea of the Sweet Potato Queen's Book of Love, which is just something that, that I had, we had laughed about with amongst the Queens, you know, um, Donna Barksdale and, and Carol Puckett. And I would, you know, walk on the track at the Y in the morning and laugh about, you know, and came up with the Book of Love and, <clears throat> all of that. And so I just threw that out there as an idea for an actual book, which it was not, but um, she liked that idea, but said it was a little spicy for the press. And, but she wanted to do the collection. 
but she sent me home with instructions. She said, go through and pick out the best ones. I'm going, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that any of them really got. Yeah. So I did nothing. But I was happy because that was always out there. Well, okay, we know I'm working on that book for Joanne, <laughs> doing nothing. And so about nine months later, Joanne called me and said uh, that she had left the press and was acquiring for Cram, a division of Random House, and mm -hmm. that she mentioned to them the idea of the Sweet Potato Queen's Book of Love. And they loved the idea and wanted to see a proposal, which I also did not know how to write. And so you see the God thing. Exactly. So helped me write the proposal and she took it and bound it. And it looked like a real book. And she took it to New York for the first meeting with Random House and lost it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Not for the meeting, no. she called Hyper Little Lighting that she had lost the book. Now I am a printer of things. I don't care about backup. Fine, you can back up all you want to. If it's not on paper, it does not exist for me. Right. So if if I'm and I don't remember what I've written. So if I write something, if it won't print out, I won't write another word. It stays on the screen <laughs> until it can be printed out because I don't believe in the backup. I know too many people that have lost everything. So I'm a printer. So luckily I had pages. So Carol and I went to her store. She had the Everyday Gourmet. At the time we went to the Everyday Gourmet in the middle of a tornado. Oh, the cool. sun was going off. Yeah. Faxed to Joanne's hotel room, the proposal, the pages. So she went to Random House, not with our professionally bound book with the pictures and all that, but with this pile of fax paper. And, you know, it smelled funny and it was yeah. smeary. And, and But they loved it and gave me a two-book contract based on that. And... That is never, I had no agent. I had no, not, nothing. I had, that is the progression. That is what God can do. Yeah. And did <laughs> for me. And that has never happened before or since in the world of publishing. I do not believe. Well, I mean, Jill, seriously, the, there, there are so many steps along the way where your self doubt could have stepped in and you could have broken that chain of success. Well, and I was so upset initially because the first, the, it was, it was going to be in trade paper. Yeah. Not, not in hardback, which is a big difference in royalty payments. Right. I was crushed and devastated. I was going, I'm not going to be really any better off than I was. And, um, you know, having no idea how many it would sell. But what it turned out is that because it was whatever it was, I don't even remember how much it was, $12, $14. People would come and buy 12 of them yeah. <laughs> for all their friends, as opposed to if it had been a $25 book, of an unknown humor writer from Mississippi. They might have spent $25, maybe, if I was really lucky. But, you know, it's they would buy stacks of them uh, for their friends. So it turned out better. How big was the, how big wa were, was, were, I, you know, whichever one, the Sweet Potato Queens at that point. So, cause I mean, you know, you're walking into a book contract with a built-in audience. Uh, you know, that makes you, obviously, the book company goes, yay. Actually not at that time. When oh, the really? book came out was in, yeah. in 99 and the parade, you know, we were here. It was just us. Yeah. Um, okay. And, I mean, the parade grew organically every year. Of course, right. it's going to beat more and more people locally into submission to come and see. We're having a great time in our own city, <laughs> uh, which is another battle. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, when that first book came out, then the parade, it came out in January of 99. And so in March, um, we saw, you know, an uptick. Uh, we actually, we, we were able to count. There were people from 22 states. Yeah. That year. And when we, but when I saw somebody in the crowd holding a sign saying, North Dakota loves the sweet potato queens. Wow. Yeah. Who knew? that there were people in North Dakota, <laughs> but I mean, based on nothing but that silly book, they read it. They loved it. They bought a plane ticket. They took time off work. They came to Jackson, Mississippi for no other reason than to dress up funny and walk down the street with us. And I said, you know, these people are highly motivated, easily led, lots of disposable income, but they are my people. <laughs> and, I love them. and so it's, it's grown from there. And now there are actually over 6,400 chapters of Sweet wow. Potato Roots. And, and they are, you know, they are very loyal and they, they're organized 
to varying degrees in, in their community. Some of them, they're um, like the, the Berry Queens in New Iberia, Louisiana. There's probably a thousand of them. And they're, it's, it's like a Mardi Gras crew. They have rules. And for me, in the whole queendom, there is only one rule. And that is whatever I say. Whenever I say it, as fast as you can with a big grin on your face. Other than that, I don't care what you do. But their their chapter they have they're like a crew and they they run it that way. But they are very civic minded. They they support Habitat for Humanity in their community. Oh, yeah. Here our our group we support uh, Children's of Mississippi and happy easiest cause in the world to get behind. Some of them in other places you know are drinking groups. <laughs> And that's, but they are gathering and they're supporting each other and they're laughing. And that's the, you know, if I don't do anything else for you, but make you laugh, I have served you well. That's true. But you've, you've, you've created family too. And that's pretty awesome in its own right. You know, we were talking about initially with this whole conversation about how do you get through tough times, being able to have a support group like that is pretty much job, job one. I mean, that's how you do it. Yeah. Take care of each other. Be yeah. there for each other. Love each other. Through, whatever. Well, and I want to remind the audience too that this all happened before the internet. So I mean, this was this yeah. is so. I, it was, Carol, yeah. her all, well, first the first book I typed on a on a portable electric typewriter, and wow. um, and actually the second book as well, and would still be if they would let me. Um, I love a typewriter. <laughs> you can rely on a typewriter. You've got paper, but um, and then after that, Carol gave me her old. Um, uh, Mac computer and it's and I cuss the thing constantly because I'm <laughs> completely ignorant of that as most things and you know it's just like with with plumbing or car trouble anything that goes wrong with something you depend on when it breaks I just want to set it on fire and get another one <laughs> and, um, and so I was you know bitterly cursing the computer all the time but yes there was no we put the website sweetpotatoqueens.com. Donna Marksdale and I did that as a total last minute, as, as the, the galleys had already gone out. It was a last minute thing in the, before the final book was published. We said, what if we had a website? And, um, and so the CELO agency, God love her, Liza, Lucer, CELO, yeah. took this on for no apparent reason, but God's love and she they created the website and um, before I mean nothing existed but we put it in the book and said you know here's our email address you know, write to us and so that first year we started getting so many emails and Donna and I both answered them and we said you know with it we invited them all to come to the parade the next year and then we started going we think they're coming <laughs> going to have to fool with them you know <laughs> and so we start everything has been playing catch up to what was actually unfolding around us and uh, it's been it's been great fun I just got back from um three weekends in Slidell Louisiana and um which is ab uh, it's it is a hidden treasure I tell you that part of the country I I not ever I, well I've been to Slidell once on uh, on book tour, but um, you know, book tour, <laughs> your yeah, best. Right, every motel looks the same. Yeah, all the Cracker Barrels, just alike. Yeah. And uh, but the um, there there's a musical, and the, uh, t another God thing. Um, on March fifteenth, two thousand three, I believe, parade weekend, the Sweet Potato Queens appeared on the front page, inexplicably on the front page of the Dallas Morning News and the LA times. <laughs> and, and so um, the LA times was read by a, a very famous personage. And um, she called me up. She said, she started reading this, this account of the parade and she started seeing, and then there were pictures and uh, she, she started hearing music. And so I got another phone call out of the blue and she said, this is Melissa Manchester. Really? Oh, yeah, that happens every day, right? <laughs> well, hey, you know, like she called all the time. And um, she said that she had, had read that account and she had gotten the book and was hearing all kinds of music. And had I ever considered the possibility of a musical? 
based on sweet potato queens. And it is my fondest dream. Willie actually had a dream of it, came downstairs. I say one morning, it was four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, <laughs> upon awakening, he said he had just dreamed that somebody wrote a Broadway musical of, um, on the sweet potato queens. And it, I have always, Music Man was the first musical I ever saw, loved it. Always thought, you know, wouldn't it be great to like be in the library or something and people just start burst into song and start doing cartwheels over the tables and so I just thought this would be a great way to live life and um but never happens and so um anyway so yes it had always been my dream for it and <clears throat> through Willie and Joanne I got to be friends with um Larry L. King and his wife the beautiful lawyer Barbara Blaine and uh you know Larry L. wrote the underlying material for Best Little Whorehouse in Texas which is also one of my all time. But, but at that time, when I met Larry L, I had never seen the stage production. I had only seen the movie of it. And yeah. Larry L hated the movie. Oh, really? Oh, that's funny. Burt Reynolds. He hit Burt Reynolds in the face. And so, <laughs> that is awesome. I don't know why he did. And I said, but you know, I loved it. It was all I'd ever seen. And I, I loved it. And, um, but he told me, you know, Larry L never, I don't think he even finished high school. And brilliant man, I don't even know how many books he's written, but he said, you know, Tater Queen, <laughs> if anybody ever gives you the choice between a high yield Texas oil well and a successful Broadway show, you take the show all day long like it was free drugs, hot sex, and the death of an enemy. <laughs> <laughs> and so Melissa called and wanted to um, wanted to to do a musical, and so. She contacted, and I said, of course, please go, do it now. And um, she partnered with Sharon Vaughn. Now, Sharon is um, in the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame. She's, her first number one was My Heroes Have Always Been Cowboys. Okay, and I mean, yeah. she is here. She is, we call, she's a hummingbird. She is now, Melissa is more like me. Melissa is very centered and very spiritual and very, you know, calm and, um, very still and um and Sharon is just we were they came to Slidell for the the uh sorry telling you I'm in Slidell they did a music they did the musical there and so I'll come back around to that but um Sharon will write you know three songs in an afternoon for I mean not just because she wants to but she's got people that are wanting songs from her um and they uh got with Rupert Holmes to write the book. Now, Rupert wrote the Pina Colada song. Yeah. Which is not why I was excited. <laughs> he also wrote the mystery of Edwin Drood, which okay. is the only show in the history of Broadway. He won every Tony. He won every, it just never before or since. And so that's who wrote this musical, those three. Wow. So it's, um, he debuted in Houston. It, it was, it's happy. It's so funny. It's so uplifting. The songs are great. And, um, but then, you know, COVID. <laughs> and so not just theater, but musical theater in particular, because singing is, um, is much more projective. And so, but, so um, Slidell, there's a, a place in Slidell, Louisiana called the Cutting Edge Theater. Brian Fontenot contacted me. And before it was even really cooked, I mean, he, uh, he called and said, I've heard about your musical and, and we want to do it. By day, the Cutting Edge is a very nice, salon beauty salon get your hair did okay by night it's a theater that seats about 120 so you go in it's you know in a strip mall in slidell yeah you go, it's a it's just a it's a very nice salon you go back a little farther there's a full bar <laughs> you go back a little farther there's a black curtain you go through the curtain and it's stadium seating and a stage and lights and so 120 people in there. Yeah. This is talk about a hummingbird. Brian Fontenot has got more energy than uh, I mean he's something. And so he had contracted to do the musical. Of course, it's been moved like three or four times. They, they were supposed to do it. I don't even know what year we're in now. What? <laughs> so I think it's 2050. I'm not sure. Last year at parade time, and they were going to come up on the the Sunday for our closing thing and do some stuff. So. It's been moved two or three times. And so um, finally did it. So they, they do weekend shows. And so um, 
for three weekends in a row, um, drove down to Slidell uh, for the show. Of course, you know, dressed up every night. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, and Sharon and Melissa came for the closing weekend of it. And um, it was so, I mean, that was a big deal, you know, and it's so great for all the performers. And, you know, they're all local people from Slidell. And, uh, you know, we just kept going. We're in a beauty shop in Slidell. <laughs> Seeing the, they're doing, they're fixing to do um, Sunset Boulevard. Mm -hmm. After that, they're doing cabaret. So I mean, they just do it. Uh, it's amazing. If you get a chance to go to Slidell, go. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you definitely piqued my curiosity. And, and you're gonna admit, anybody who can think of that combination is obviously just a just a he genius. Was not despite, well, first he did it in the in the beauty shop. He would just rearrange the chairs, and oh, be, wow. then after that went so well. He, he built this thing himself in the back. It's just, you know, <laughs> I'll post pictures of it, the theater. I mean, it's incredible. Well, I mean, how much, I mean that's, I mean, I'm about to say, it's always cool and, and, you know, it's always neat when you can go to a bookstore and see your book sitting there. That's always a great feeling and it's fun to get to write in them and do that stuff. I can't even imagine how cool it is to sit in an audience and, and see every, all your creativity come to life on a oh, stage like that. On the stage, but what it's always, what's hilarious is that it's kind of like Rocky Horror. I mean, it, it's a cult thing. I mean, it, yeah. when we lost COVID and it can be, I mean, Lord, everybody needs to be seeing this show. It's so funny. It's so uplifting. It, it's what we need to laugh. And so people came. There was a crew from, from Florida that chartered a bus to come to find out from Florida, right. which is you know, quite a haul. And for the entire weekend, then all the ones in Texas and Louisiana came in. And so they were like me, they're dressed and George Ewing went with me every time Scott Caples came from Tupelo. So we're dressed every night. And so every night there would be a bunch of people who were, who knew why they were there and they were dressed and they've got on feathers and rhinestones and sequins and, and all this stuff. And then there were what we call the virgins. <laughs> and I would say, I would, I talked a little bit before each night before the show. I'd say, okay, who is here who has no idea why you're here? And they would be, you know, looking <laughs> around because <laughs> we're all there. You know, I've got on a crown this high. And, um, they're going, wow, I'm so underdressed, you know. And um, so I said, well, we will heal you. We have been healing virgins since 1982. And so um, they, um, and they, but they all got it. That was what was so great was to see that people that were there who knew nothing, had never read the books, had no idea, you know, who I was or who any of us were while we were there, uh, got it and, and loved it. So I think, you know, it's, um, it is universal. The message is universal. You know, I, I, I mean, I love the story how you even came up with the sweet potato Queens in the first place. I mean, <laughs> You know, I mean, it just, it's so, it's so you, to be honest with you. It's just a great story. Well, that was, um, you know, I was um, divorced for the first time. My daddy had died and um, I was looking for something, you know, to cheer myself up. And, and, and I was, you know, not the first or only time, you know, looking at my life going, really? <laughs> this is what you've done. And, you know, cause like I said, I didn't go to college and I will forever beat myself up for that, but you know, God has overcome it. At any rate, you know, I was going to, you can't do anything. You know, there is, there is nothing. And, and so I decided, well, I can smile nearly every tooth in my head at nothing. I can do it for a long time. <laughs> I can wave. Oh yeah. Either hand, ambidextrous wave. I don't even think the queen can do that. I know, and she does this, which I don't care for. Well, she's ninety-nine years old too. Makes no sense. But um, but I mean, you know, Miss America, it's always this way. Which oh, yeah. I'm watching. So, and anyway, I can form an opinion that fast about virtually or literally no information whatsoever with. You know, and just that fast. I have no information at all, and that's fine. I prefer it that way. Um, it's my opinion. And people will mind me. I don't know why. That, it's probably because I'm huge and they're afraid, but 
does the pictures of me standing at, at the at the Slidell event with Melissa and Sharon. Melissa is tiny, and Sharon is an elf. I mean, these are and and there's me in all my ruffles and crowns and stuff, just hawking. But anyway, um, those were I saw those were the gifts that I got here with. And you know, the Bible tells us that you know. And the talents that some got more than others, but everybody got at least one. You should not hide your light under a bushel. Don't bear it. I don't know what my light was, let alone my bushel, but um, I did have, those were my gifts. And then I saw a picture, a photograph of our mother, um, who oddly enough looks exactly like Queen Elizabeth. I mean, it is, I mean, from the day one, I mean, childhood, teenage, everything, they, they look uncannily alike and mama was adopted from unknown biological parentage so it was no great leap for me to go <laughs> a queen i was there to be a queen <laughs> a job you know and i am gifted in that and so i decided i should be the queen but then i had to you know look for a queendom um because Everybody that wants a queen, all the countries that want them, you know, have them. And there's no turnover. They live forever. Yeah. And they've got a great line of succession lined up. I have no chance. And so, well, first I thought we might be related to the Windsors um, with the whole adoption thing, you know. But um, that did not pan out. Uh, they're That's probably uh, okay, to be honest with you. It's just a coincidence. They look alike. Yeah. Um, not related. But... Um, and then about that same time, um, my, my friend, well, Malcolm said he was going to have the, the first ever St. Patrick's parade. And so daddy always said, you know, put spectating on a sin level, that if there's something going on and you are in any way capable of participating, you should do so. And, uh, and that you should do what you will wish you had done when you're 50. Um, now, you know, when I heard that, I was probably eight, 12, you know, and thought, Dear God, who would even want to live to be that old? That is just, but whenever I had a choice to make, you know, should I do this or not? I figured by the time I was 50, I'd wish I had. So I did. And I can say some of those things I'm glad I did. <laughs> some of them maybe could have left undid, but at any rate, I did them. And uh, now I've moved that up to the nursing home. What am I going to wish I had done when I get to the nursing home, which is not far off? Um and, you know, there's nobody in the nursing home wishing they had dusted the stairs a few more times or served on a few more committees. So we need to have fun. So I'm thinking I need to be the queen of something. Malcolm's having this parade. And my friend Sherry Anglin tells me that her father has land in Bardeman, Mississippi, which, of course, we know is the sweet potato capital of the world. Now, I've since learned that every place on the planet that grows a sweet potato makes the same <laughs> claim to fame, but they are ours and I support them in it. And so um, she said, yeah, her, her, her daddy had a, had a pickup truck and had Anglin sweet potato farms, plural, on the side. Well, what he actually had was a garden <laughs> in Vardaman, which I just loved. I loved the, the, you know, that ambition, that, that belief farms, you know, that one day there will be sweet potatoes as far as the eye can see. <laughs> and, uh, in the meantime, I've got this, you know, quarter of an acre. <laughs> and, uh, but, um, but she said, tell me, I had no idea there was a sweet potato festival at the time. And she said, you know, was telling me about it. And I said, they got a queen for that? <laughs> she said, well, she didn't. I said, well, I'd be glad to do it. You know, I'm looking for a gig. I need to be the queen of something. And I could get, I could get my own crown. My own, I'd run up the road. I'd be the queen every year and go home. They wouldn't have to do anything. I'd just show up and be the queen. And well, of course that did not pan out. They have a pageant. <laughs> They're real set in that. But <laughs> I thought it sounded funny and still do. So I declared myself to be the sweet potato queen. And for no other reason, I was in that parade, became the sweet potato queen purely to entertain myself mm -hmm. and get over, you know, the bad things that were happening in my life. And hey, thank you, you for watching this episode of Mississippi Story. <laughs> Make <laughs> sure to subscribe so. <laughs> to the Mississippi Today YouTube I'm still, channel. I mean, and click the bell to be notified it every is, time I a have new got, video uploads. I cannot tell you how much organza and lame and fringe and sequins. And, I mean, there is...
a lot in this house and in George's barn. <laughs> I was going to ask if y'all had to build an outbuilding or a she shed to put everything in the back. George has a giant barn. He keeps all of, all of the sweet because the outfits, you know, are not small <laughs> with no. all the embellishments. I mean, and, and they've had to grow over the years because we have. <laughs> I, I shudder. I was so glad that we were canceled this year. Um, because I don't know if I can get in that. <laughs> so many people I see have spent their year of quarantine, you know, training for marathons or getting PhDs or do what I did. I invented a cookie. I invented a new cookie, mm -hmm. uh, but it took many, many incarnations, all of which I ate <laughs> before I got to what I consider to be today the perfect cookie. And I would say at, at least I was probably gaining on 25 pounds worth of cookie I'm sitting on right now. <laughs> and, um, I don't know if I could get in that outfit today, but, uh, and it's enormous. It, it has to be really big to make our parts look really small, you know, <laughs> by comparison. I can hardly get through some doorways <laughs> in the outfit. So George has a big barn and stores all of those outfits there. So, so I predict like a Rocky montage as you're training for next year's parade. Oh, I can't even, I, I can't even go there in my mind of seeing myself moving. <laughs> I'm right there with you. I did the COVID-25 myself. So it was definitely, it's like, oh, I discovered carbohydrates and they're wonderful. So For us. <laughs> I'm thinking of something just with a head hole and some arm holes. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about that. I mean, if your friend had been from Smith County, you could have been the watermelon queen. I mean, there were just all kinds of, it was just fate that you ended up being the sweet potato queen and it worked out really well. I think. And um, yeah. it has grown to um, such proportions. I'm yeah. profoundly grateful. Well, that's what I said. I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, I would think you'd have to be the most proud of the fact that just like you said, you're empowering so many groups of, of women to get together and to, to be there for each other. That's got to be incredibly rewarding. Well, and to, it, it, it's important to be happy. Yeah. That was what, you know, Jesus said, I came that, you know, may have joy and your joy be complete. Yeah. Um, he does not intend for us to, you know, limp along and suffer along. And so, um, you know, I worked for a man for, for many years that I, I despised the job, truly, but loved him. Yeah. Um, many people locally will remember him, Frank Mastronardi. And uh, he was a positive mental attitude junkie. I yeah. mean, he played us, I have heard every every word ever spoken by Zig Ziglar. I'll see, I'll see they'll come up on Facebook, Zig Ziglar quotes. I was going, heard it. You know, <laughs> and, uh, W. Clement Stone, uh, uh, Earl Nightingale, all those guys. And one thing that they all said in common that really spoke to me was that you should do what makes your heart sing and yeah. the money will follow, find your joy and money will, will come. And, uh, but I was 19 and working in the credit department at Sears <laughs> at the time. And so it might've made Mr. M's heart sing to be there and did not mind. And, but I took that with me and I will tell you absolutely I have witnesses that the first time I stood on the back of that pickup truck and smiled and waved and threw sweet potatoes, I did say, somebody will pay me to do this. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> now, and people ask me all the time, did you ever imagine, you know, when you did that, it would turn into this going, what if I had, what if I said, okay, this is my five-year plan. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm declare myself the queen of this and I'm going to dress like, like the, and no, it was not my five-year plan. Well, I mean, you could have never predicted when you're sitting there throwing sweet potatoes at people, which that sounds inherently dangerous to be honest with you, to be whacked by a sweet potato. I mean, it, <laughs> and, you, know, I mean you were, you know, like I said, a trainer at the Y, so you could probably put some velocity behind it too, but you, you never would have dreamed you would sit between George Bush and, and Barbara Bush and to get that friendship going. I mean, there's just been so many wonderful things that have come from, from all the, from just taking that risk to write that first column. Yes. Just, you know, do what you can, what's in front of you. Uh, pay attention. 
take those opportunities, even though it doesn't, it didn't look like an, it, for, for the Diddy. I mean, it looked like an opportunity for maybe $20. <laughs> yeah, 20 bucks is 20 bucks. No, I mean, I understand. You know, then I got bumped up and I was lucky if I got $25. <laughs> and, yeah. But mostly it was like, if anybody bought ads, that, you know, we got anything, but um, it was fun to do. Yeah. It was just yeah. And and I, I really, you know, the whole Malcolm Gladwell thing where you got to work 20,000 hours or 10,000 hours or whatever it is, if you're not liking what you're doing, you're not going to put in that work. No. 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 It, it's, you know, it's important to have joy in your life. And not everybody, I, I guess, you know, some folks, I mean, you got to do what you got to do to put food on the table. Well, that's true. Yeah. But find your joy somewhere. Right. If it's not in your work then find something that, you know, that fills your heart, that makes your heart sing in your off time and pursue that with passion. And I know more people that have done that and it's turned into, you know, where they end up quitting the other job and pursuing, you know, where opportunities presented themselves and they, for other work and they took it. So I'm going to tell you a real quick story. I mean, when I was learning to water ski, I was like eight years old and dad was dragging me up and down the Tennessee river and I couldn't get up apparently like dragging a concrete block behind the boat. And he was starting to get frustrated because he loved to water ski and he wanted me to love it. He was 40. I was eight, but I was really eight. And he, I mean, 40 and he was really eight. So, I mean, it was just, dad, dad was a big kid and I finally got up and it kind of surprised him. So, you know, being my dad, the first thing he tried to do is knock me over. So he started driving the boat in a circle and, and I hit a stick and did cartwheels and the ski hit me in the head. And I mean, I was laying there in the water and, and he, he pulled the boat around and he started poking me with a paddle. And I was like, what are you doing? And he said, grab the rope. And I said, no, I'm, I'm getting in the boat. And he's like, no, you're going to grab the rope. And you're going to get back up. And I said, give me one good reason why. And he said, because we're going to make your story about how you got back up, not how you fell down. Although I'm going to tell everybody how you fell down because it was hilarious. <laughs> well, I mean, 25 years later, Jill, I mean, I'm sitting there in the hospital. I just had melanoma surgery. And my dad picks me up out of bed and walks me around the the hospital saying, you know what, we're going to make your story about how you beat cancer, not how you had cancer. And, and the one golden thread of your life and, and of what you do is that you continuously kept grabbing the rope and getting back up and keep doing things. I mean, you could, you could have thrown an epic pity party at any given point early on. Well, and not to say that I didn't along the way. <laughs> Many yeah. Times. Well, it was probably a hell of a lot of fun, to be honest with you. Yeah. But, uh, you know, then at some point, then you, you know, that passes and you, you see what's in front of you to do. Find yeah. something to laugh at. The humor will, will lead you out, you know? Definitely. But, you know, right now, um, you know, like I said, we're, we're, we're staying at home a lot more than we used to, although it has been nice getting out. And now the Delta variant is kind of like bleh, taking that, making that seem to be a little bit questionable. But what are are you still – what are you doing? Obviously you got the play. I mean, the musical going and you know, you, you wrote, you've written, what did you write? Nine books? I was, yeah. Nine. I, well, I mean the, the, the bio was a little off, so I just wanted to make sure I had that right. But are you writing more books? I mean, your Facebook page is fantastic. I love following it because it generally gives me a laugh every day, which I appreciate or something to think about, which is good too. But are you doing are you doing any writing right now, or are you just kind of kicking back and just trying to figure out? Okay, I need uh, I, I get to be a grandmom now, and I got a really cool daughter, and I get to go see her and do that sort of thing. So, I am writing. It's different. Yeah, uh, what I'm writing is different, and you know I don't know if I have a publisher. Um, you know the the first five were with were with Random House, and then I was with Simon and Schuster, and the last book was with Amazon Publishing. Um, yeah. Their, their publishing arm uh, but it's been 10 years since I wrote anything and this one is different yeah. um, and so I don't know my job is to write it, it it's right. something that has you know been on my heart for about 33 years and um, and so God will get it to whoever needs to hear it and um, so it's just my job to put it down well tell us a little bit about what you're writing Hang on. Okay. It's my first walk off ever in an interview. <laughs> okay. This will not tell you anything. 
Yeah. But it's not her. <laughs> What's that? It's about her. Can you see her? Yeah, I can see her. Okay. okay. Well, I look forward to finding out more about her. <laughs> she seems nice. She's quiet. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes that's a good thing. Bless her heart. So, yes. Yeah. This, this is a very powerful symbol for me. And um, so I'm telling her story as she Excellent. came. And, well, uh, well, let me know when it comes out because I want to be one of the first to read it. I will. I will do that. Jill, I've taken a, a chunk of your time, but I, I, you know, I love hearing your stories and I love talking to you. You know, I never have considered that I have ever interviewed you. I've just always had a really wonderful conversation every time we talked. And yeah, I do remember those old days at the Y um, when you were there and I was there. And, yeah. And now, you know, people are stealing the copper wires out of the building. It's kind of sad, but um, that, that seems like a long time ago, but boy, your life has been wonderful ever since. And you've, you've helped make a lot of other people's lives real wonderful. So I think that's pretty cool. As they do mine on a daily basis. So. And you've made my life good too. So I want to say thank you here publicly as well. It's, you know, everything that you went through and I saw your struggles and I knew your struggles and I felt your, I knew that fear. And, but I told you, God's got something better. I mean, look where you are now. Yeah, no, you were you were a hundred percent right. So I now I listen to you, and I don't I don't ever doubt you anymore. God's got. He's always. Sometimes he has to blast us out of where we are. Yeah. Like I was so comfortable. I yeah. mean, I was perfectly happy. Thirty thousand dollars in debt, but servicing that with you know twenty dollars a month from <laughs> different columns, and you know I would never have done anything else. I was terrified when the business journal dropped that story because that threw my balance off. And, but God had always, always has something. I, I still can't believe somebody didn't think you were funny, but then again, you know, that could have been a moment where you said, well, maybe they're right. Well, it could have, but yeah. I mean, that was, I, you know, I was going, well, I'm laughing all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it can't be right. <laughs> I crack myself up. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad everything worked out. And the other thing too, I was going to add is it, one of the things through this whole interview, you were mentioning names of people. And I know most of the people that you mentioned and I've always, dad always told me that you're some of the, your five closest friends. And, wow. and you mentioned some really, really cool people through, through there. And so that was kind of cool too. And I think that's always, I mean, of course, then again, they had you as a friend. So that's a really cool person too. But I mean, I think that, you know, the whole idea of the sweet potato Queens is you're surrounding yourself with really good people. And I, I'm really proud of the fact that you were able to take your life experience and expand it out on a much bigger room. Celebrate life and enjoy where we are. Yeah. Jack, you know, it has never in my entire life. And I've lived here since I was two years old, born in Tupelo, only in Mississippi. Would it be a distinction? But yeah. No, you and Elvis. Yeah. Raised, raised in Jackson, in South Jackson, and um, had a fabulous childhood. It has never, as long as I can remember, been fashionable to like it here. <laughs> always, well, and when I was young, it was always, we're going to move to Colorado. And, you know, I'm just going, you know, it's, I've always loved it here. And yeah. it's, uh, we live in Raymond now, which I'm, it, extremely happy speed limit is 25 miles an hour and they enforce it like national security depends on them and <laughs> perfect for me um but to, uh, whenever i speak locally i always say you know if you have been to new orleans or dallas or atlanta or memphis you know for any function at all and have not been to house st patty's Bray right here in jackson just kiss my <laughs> I mean, it just support what we've got here. We've got, well, I don't, if I go to New York, all I care about is going to shows. And there was one restaurant I wanted to eat at, the Edison Diner, because they had matzo ball soup. And since Irv died, we don't have old time delicatessen. I can't get matzo ball soup here. That's the only thing. All the other restaurants, fine. I can get, there are fine restaurants here in Jackson, locally owned, operated, locally sourced. I mean, I don't need to travel for good food. I mean, it's, we have so many things in our city to be proud of and to enjoy. Go try them. <laughs> you know? Definitely. Jill, thank you so much. Thank you. Always. Yeah.
Yeah, it's always good to talk to you. So appreciate this. It's been this has been a good time. I appreciate it. In particular. Thank you. <laughs> hey, thank you for watching this episode of Mississippi Stories. Make sure to subscribe to the Mississippi Today YouTube channel and click the bell to be notified every time a new video uploads.